The Death Worlders, a story by Hambone. Chapter 7. Tensions. Three years after the Vancouver attack, I-5, northbound, Everett, Washington. Thup, 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 uh, click. Might as well face it, might as well face it, you're addicted to love. Might as well face it, might as well face it, might as well face it. The 5 o'clock free ride classic 92.9 KISM. See me ride out of the sunset on your color TV screen. Out for all that I can get, if you know what I mean. Click. 100% chance of rain, but we got a great matchup tonight. Washington taking on the Dallas Cowboys. Click. Results are in from across the globe as China announced their representative for the first meeting of the Global Representative Assembly. And not a moment too soon with the Assembly's first meeting taking place next week in Cape Town, South Africa, to appoint the world's ambassador in space. Crazy, right? And just think, this time three years ago, we thought the alien abduction people were all whack jobs. Most were. And then good old NASA, and forgive me folks, but I still think of it as an American institution. The National in National Aeronautics and Space Administration stands for U.S. after all. They may have kept the acronym, but don't try and sell me this bull about how it's the NATO Aeronautics and Space Agency nowadays. NASA landed men on the moon back in 69, and I don't care if it was a Canadian scientist who invented the warp drive or whatever they're calling it, but it was an American who flew Pandora, am I right? Asshole. So Pandora flew to, I don't know, Mercury and back? Jupiter, dickwad. And all of a sudden it's like, hello humanity, welcome to the stars, join us all in sunshine and hugs, and yeah, we're really sorry about locking you up, please do us the honor of sending forth what you who mens call an ambassador, that we might blah blah blah. Why are we even bothering? You know what those alien douche nozzles deserve? Two fingers, one on each hand. Tell them to come back once they've found Jesus. Oh, for click. Fuck's sake. Thup, 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 thup. Fuck it. Click. And we put a Democrat in our seat on this assembly. I thought we were supposed to be appointing somebody to represent America's interests. Am I right? Ugh. Click. Thup, 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 thup. 1,500 kilometers above the Arabian Peninsula. Ping NEO tracking. Green. Test EACS. Check. Sublime power to idle. Check. Power to ISDE. Check. Test ERB2. Check. Test ESVALS. Check. Test ESHOD. Check. Pandora. Mission control. Checklist complete. Mission control. Pandora. Checklist complete. Copy that, Riley. Scotch Creek reports the package is ready. In your own time. Hey, what is this, Houston? My fifth? Fifth. Yes. She laughed. And nobody else has even done this once yet. Elitist. Just try not to slam into the moon at seven kilo lights. We've only got one. She decided that she liked her new controller. He wasn't afraid to drop the professional bullshit and send a joke up the line to comfort her nerves. I'll try, Mission Control. Pandora, going FTL. On her own insistence, the silly big red button had been replaced with a thrust lever. It just felt more right. More Star Wars. Granted, it only output a binary go command to the navigation computer rather than providing analog control over the engine power, but it still just felt right to reach forward, grip a solid chunk of plastic and metal, and push it firmly forward as far as it would go. She patted an exposed patch of Pandora's hull fondly. Let's ride, baby. This was by far the shortest hop they had done yet. She didn't even have time to see anything happen. The moon just became bigger. In less time than an eye blink, it ceased to be a distinct object in the sky, accessible in its entirety with the naked eye. Now it was an expansive feature. She realized she was now the closest person to Luna since 1972, although still deceptively far away at some 64,000 kilometers. Close, but not directly on top of the Earth-Moon L1 point. Mission Control, Pandora, checkpoint reached. Nicely done. ESDAR has you on target to a... Point three deviation. My compliments to navigation. She could already hear the applause in the background. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty happy. ERB2 is still reading green. I have go code from the package. Copy control. Opening the door. This piece of equipment was mission specific, and although Pandora had been designed with future proofing in mind, she hadn't been designed to interface with alien technology, which was why the mission package was activated via a smartphone that had been duct taped to the flight console. She reached out and tapped the app icon with the stylus that had been secured to the back of her flight glove with the most useful substance in space, some more duct tape. A space station blinked into existence three kilometers in front of her. 
All things considered, its arrival was depressingly anticlimactic. She'd been hoping for special effects, maybe some kind of wibbly-wobbly space fireworks. At most, she detected a faint shimmering of the stars around it, as if space had bulged gently. The station itself, however, was impressive. Pandora was by no means a small vehicle, but the station was orders of magnitude larger, reminding her of the time she had gone surfing in California only for a right whale to breach the surface just ten feet to her right, but scaled up to eleven. It was like being ambushed by an airport terminal. Fortunately, they had thought to compare notes as to communication protocols, wavelengths, and codecs before the mission, so the transmission from it was clear and bright. The voice that spoke did so in curiously accentless English. Embassy Station 172, jump complete. Our thanks. Welcome to Sol 172. It is a pleasure to be here, Pandora. Will you be docking? Not in my mission profile, 172. I'm sorry. I'd love to come aboard. We understand, Pandora. Launching shuttles. They will follow you on autopilot to a safe landing facility. I look forward to coming back. We look forward to it, too. In fact, we request that you be the pilot who escorts your world's selected ambassador on board. It seems only fair. Riley grinned inside her helmet. Wild horses couldn't hold me back. Scotch Creek Extraterrestrial Research Facility. Hey, Kevin. Jenkins turned at a familiar voice speaking his name and laughed aloud when he saw who it was. <laughs> Shit! Terry Boone! When the hell was the last time I saw you? She'd lost weight and muscle tone. Her hair had gone from a shoulder-length bob to halfway down her back, and she looked like death warmed up, but she still treated him to a smile. About two and a half years ago, she sat down. Nice bar you've got here. You can sell booze on a military base? Why not? They aren't on duty all the time, and they've got families. Good coffee, too. And you look like you need some. Oh, hell yes. You do lattes? He busied himself with the espresso machine. The best lattes in Scotch Creek, I promise, he said, tamping down the coffee grounds and locking the portafilter into the group. I've seen Scotch Creek, and that's not much of a boast, she said, watching as he selected a panini and slid it into the grill for good measure. You should have seen it when the convoy first got here. It's five times the size it was then. And 80% of that's the base? Yep. He finished the drink with a flourish of steamed milk and slid it in front of her. On me, he said. She picked it up like it was made with water from the Fountain of Youth and sipped it. Okay, that's damn good coffee, she allowed, sagging as it chased the tension of a long journey out of her. Told you, he said, pressing down on the panini grill. Now, not that I'm not glad to see you again, but this ain't a social call, am I right? It's business, she acknowledged. I'm kind of betraying my employer's trust. Your mysterious employer? Jenkins asked. He plated the panini and set it down doing that too handsome guy smile up one side of his face as she grabbed it and took a huge bite. Finally exceeded your professional ethic, huh? Mm. Oh my god, what's in this? Bacon, brie, and cranberry, Jenkins told her. Mm. I'll never say a bad word about the French ever again, Terry promised. So, what are you breaking trust over? Well, he's going to be getting this information too, but I just figured that you might find a use for a list of every abductee who's currently outside the bubble. You're shitting me. She pulled a USB stick from her bag. Nope. It's just a big guess, the end result of 30 months of globetrotting research and questioning people who most of the time didn't speak English, but I'm pretty sure it's mostly right. Jenkins picked up the device and pocketed it. I'll make sure the ambassador finds out about this. You've got a line to him. No, but I play poker with somebody who does. She inhaled the rest of her panini. God, I needed that. Where the fuck did you drive from? Mexico? Pretty much. Got a place to stay? If you know any comfortable couches that are going spare. How about a futon? She sighed happily. Oh, oh, yeah. You know what a weary traveler needs. Ten days later, Cape Canaveral. Captain Jackson. She scooted out from under Pandora's port wing where she and a flight technician had been fine-tuning the S-Falls array. Dr. Anise Hussein, I presume, she said, rising from her trolley to extend a hand to Earth's selected ambassador. He cut a strange figure, a small, bald, bearded Iraqi man in a nice suit, leaning slightly on a beautiful polished wooden walking stick while around him men and women in jumpsuits bustled back and forth, prepping Pandora and the three alien shuttlecraft for flight, though the latter apparently required practically no maintenance. The fourth had been shipped north to Scotch Creek to be enthusiastically devoured by the reverse engineering teams. For my sins, he agreed, shaking her hand and smiling warmly. Riley returned the smile genuinely. She had always had a soft spot for charming old men with a twinkle in their eye, and for all that he was twice her age, Dr. Hussein had that kind of charisma by the ton. She's beautiful, he added, looking towards Pandora and instantly winning Riley's good graces. 
She is, she sighed, looking fondly at her sled. Less so when she's grounded, though. She's born to fly. I look forward to seeing that. I understand you'll be flying her up alongside our shuttle. Her esteem for him grew even further. He wasn't complaining or even questioning that she should be flying Pandora rather than the shuttle. The ambassador was clearly an expert at first impressions. The embassy did say they hoped I'd be the one to escort you, and frankly, sir, flying anything else would feel like cheating on her, she said. I guessed as much, Hussein replied amicably, folding his hands gently on his cane. I wish there was a second seat, actually. Something tells me nobody will ever pilot her but you. They'd have to shoot me before I let somebody else fly my girl, Riley agreed matter-of-factly. I had best leave you two keeping her in perfect order, then. Please, it's a long checklist. Leaving so soon? Terry sighed. You woke up, she accused. Hey, you're the one sneaking away without saying goodbye. It's not even light out yet. I've been here ten days, Kevin, she said. She stooped and collected a discarded bra and shrugged into it, trying not to let the way his dark eyes roamed all over her, getting a good last look, affect her. Those ten days had been enthusiastic. Both of them had made up for a couple of long, dry years. I need to get back. I know, he said, and stood up. She took her own opportunity to get a good look at him as he yawned, stretched, and then put on some pants. I'm not dumb enough to do something soppy like try and stop you, neither. I just figured you may as well start the trip with a full stomach and a proper farewell. I guess? Come on. Best pancakes in Scotch Creek, I promise. I've seen Scotch Creek, and that's not much of a boast. Test S Falls. Check. Test Eshad. And check. Pandora Mission Control. Checklist complete. Mission Control, Pandora. Checklist complete. Every time Pandora performed just a little better. Or maybe it was just that Riley herself was becoming more in tune with her sled's foibles. But she could swear that the disconcerting wobble that had defined their previous s vertical takeoffs was gone now. You all right over there, Limo? She asked of the pilot of the diplomatic shuttle on her wing. Oh. You all right over there, Limo? She asked of the pilot of the diplomatic shuttle on her right as both craft extended their flight surface fields and coasted higher and higher on only a gentle thrust. Jealous of you, this thing handles like my sister's car. That bad? The controls are idiot-proof. Riley made an ah noise of understanding. Idiot-proof meant one thing to an experienced pilot, that you couldn't do half of the things you would like to have available as options. Hey, at least you can scratch your nose, she said, leaning forward to brush that offending organ against the patch of Velcro that had been glued to the inside of her helmet. The helmet was full of little customizations like that. From the Velcro pad to a suction nozzle in case of a repeat of Luca Parmitano's experience with water flowing freely inside the helmet or, God forbid, Riley vomiting, the whole suit was a testament to the power of cobbled together solutions to mirror the whole suit was a testament to the power of cobbled together solutions to minor irritations and was designed for long-term habitation, right down to some rather cunning plumbing around the pelvis. She could have worn it for a week and experienced nothing worse than the desperate need for a bath. She noticed with amusement that she had forgotten to remove the smartphone stylus from her glove. Oh well, it would probably prove useful anyway. And you can thumb yours at us, this thing gets three kilos tops. You're kidding. Nope, I'm flying the next best thing to a moped. Comfy in here, though. No expense spared in upholstering the ambassadorial transport, she chuckled. Next to Pandora's sleek yet functional lines that showed off her Lockheed heritage, the shuttle was an uninspiring box that relied entirely on its fields for aerodynamic profile. A team of designers had done their best, stripping off the original beige paint and polishing the metal to a mirror shine, and reportedly filling the interior with tasteful wood and woven fabrics. The original leather upholstery idea had been swiftly abandoned on the advice that the aliens were almost universally herbivores and would be thoroughly disgusted by the idea of sitting on a once-living thing's skin or even a facsimile of it. Pandora alerted her to something with a pleasant beep. Coming up on Delta Point One, she said. It was deceptive how quickly space could sneak up on them when the ride was so gentle. I see it. Slaving FTL to you. Mission Control, limo. Escort has the button. I have it, Mission Control. Pandora. Escort has the button. Pandora, Mission Control, you are clear for FTL. She didn't bother making any comment this time. Just rubbed the exposed bit of Pandora's chassis for luck and pushed the thrust lever forward. Again, the moon just blinked larger in the sky and there was Embassy 172, an impressive tower of white almost blinding in the sunlight even through her dark glasses and Pandora's own reactive window tint. 
172 Pandora, Ambassadorial Transport on Final Approach. Copy Pandora. The Ambassador is cleared for Bay 1. Will you be coming aboard? I will, 172. Pandora requesting permission to land. Permission granted. You are cleared for Bay 3. Ah. Uh, Pandora, we can't handshake with your landing system. It's giving an incompatible protocol error. Damn it. Riley scrabbled to troubleshoot the problem, then decided it wasn't worth her time. Copy that, 172. Request permission for a manual landing. There was a pause filled with the hiss of solar radiation and nothing more. Pandora, did you just say manual landing? Affirmative, 172. Manual landing. That's... Oh. Right. Yes, sir. Pandora, you are clear for manual landing. Bay 3. Copy, 172. Bay 3. Riley shook her head in bemusement as she rounded the station's bulk and lined up on her assigned bay. In fact, of all the maneuvers she had rehearsed in the simulator before Pandora was even built, manually landing on an enclosed flight deck aboard a steadily rotating space station had been one of the first and easiest. And that had been when they still thought she'd have thrusters that required fuel. Nowadays, with an unlimited thrust budget, it was even simpler. Match rotation, nose forward, probe forward with S-falls, and haul herself forward and gently onto the deck. Frankly, she doubted that the computer could have done it any smoother. Compared to landing on an aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf, landing on Embassy 172 was trivial. By the time post-flight checks, power down, and securing her ship had finished, the bay had become host to a welcoming party of weirdness. She tried not to stare at them as she swung her boots over and dropped down to the deck easily, and buoyant in the light gravity. Oh my god, that one looks just like Rocket Raccoon. Don't stare, don't stare. A short creature with the uncomfortably familiar face beloved by the UFO community the world over approached, trailed by an archway of some kind that moved on a hovering pad, which settled in front of Riley. She tried not to let the fact that half the assembled beings apparently had no issue with nudity bother her. Strangely, the one wearing the most clothing of all of them was the furry little raccoon alien, who was wearing a garment that seemed to resemble a cross between her own flight suit and a pair of dungarees. Captain, if you would be so kind as to step through this decontamination archway before removing your flight suit, you would save us all a great deal of trouble and potential agonizing death, requested the Grey. Up close, she could see that the movements of its mouth bore no relation at all to what she actually heard, which was a pleasant male tenor with a faint hint of condescension? Intellectual superiority? The effect was convincing and humanizing, at least. Sure, she said happily and stepped through it, followed by, wow, oh my god, that feels weird. The little gray alien stepped forward sharply. Are you in pain? He asked, tone tinged with concern. No, no, just, wow, my teeth have never felt so clean. Ah, yes, Streptococcus salivarius in particular proved to be exceptionally resilient, as did Staphylococcus aureus, but we beat them in the end. You may remove your helmet now, Captain. We are, for the time being, quite safe from you. Riley did so, pleased to be out of it, and took the opportunity to scratch an itch above her ear. I knew that stylus would be useful. Excellent. If you intend on staying longer than eight hours, we will need to give you a longer-lasting injection, or even, if you are willing, a permanent implant. Until then, I shall leave you in the capable hands of the rest of the crew. Riley watched him go. Wow. I've had some terse doctors in my time, she said. There was a chittering noise from the space raccoon. Something in his body language suggested amusement. So she decided that the chittering had probably been the equivalent of laughter. Her suspicions were confirmed when the translator gave him a wry baritone. By his species standards, that was a warm welcome. Riley smiled. I guess I got so caught up in flying Pandora there that I forgot to read the cliff notes on everyone. She looked around, taking in the blue and white giraffe people, the bat person, an enormous pile of fur in the back that seemed to be content to observe from a distance for the time being, and more. Most of the rest of her welcome party sketched respectful gestures of welcome and left her to converse with the raccoon. I can't blame you. It's beautiful. She is, isn't she? She? As you wish. And I've got to say that was some beautiful flying. I know traffic routing get fidgety over manual landings in their bays, but I've never seen a landing that smooth from anything muscle or machine. You're a pilot yourself? I am. Officer Goru of Clan Firefang. My species are called Gowans. Captain Riley Jackson, NASA. Human, obviously. A pleasure. Be gentle, right? You could probably crush my hand if you squeeze too hard. He extended a hand, and it was, to her relief, definitely a hand. An honest tool user's fingers rather than an animal's paw. So she disengaged the pressure seal on her gauntlets, removed them, and shook the offered extremity as delicately as she could, intrigued at how warm and silky the short fur of his hands was. I'm shaking hands with an intelligent alien raccoon. Holy shit. Want to see Pandora up close? She offered. 
I still have a few post-flight checks to run through. It would be my pleasure, Goru said. He started to enthuse more and more as they got closer to the sled's hull. She's so aerodynamic. By the time my kind developed warp technology, we'd long since abandoned these kinds of curves in favor of shaped fields. She was mostly made by a company called Lockheed, Riley said. She's got those shaped fields too, but they stuck to a policy of, if it's not broken, don't fix it. After all, if the fields fail, I'd rather not be flying something with the aerodynamic profile of a boot. That makes a lot of sense, actually. I might have to take that saying home, Goru said. He stooped to look under Pandora's belly. Huh, you're kind go in for redundancy in a big way, don't you? Pressurized cabin and pressurized flight suit? The whole hull and field thing? Two force field landing systems? She could limp home on just one engine, too. It's called Murphy's Law. Your legislation mandates are redundant systems? Riley laughed. No, no, Murphy's Law isn't legislation. It's an observation. Like a law of physics. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong, eventually. I'm taking that one home, too, Goru said. Oh, a field-assisted scramjet? Yep. She's the fastest thing we ever built by a long, long way, both in space and in Atmo. Mach 20 across the ground, easy. What's her maximum? We don't actually know, Riley beamed, correctly interpreting the Gowan's open-muzzled expression for the dazed awe that it was. She opened a hatch, checked something inside, closed and sealed it, checked the seal, and then ticked something off on the little book attached to her wrist. Theoretically, with the fields doing the heavy lifting and taking mechanical stresses out of the equation, we think... She could hit somewhere upwards of Mach 30? Of course, that's small fry next to the FTL. Well, well, obviously, Goru agreed. What's she do? That depends on how much I give her, Riley told him. I guess if I really pushed her, 70 kilo lights for six hours? Of course, right now, that'd be a one-way trip. They've not finished the witches yet. 70? How? She's not big enough for a power plant that size. Especially given that, no offense, I doubt your first ever FTL engine is very efficient. And what's witches? None taken. She'll get faster as we swap out the FDL core. She was built to be future-proof. Anyway, the power plants for running the onboard electronics and life support. Power to the FDL comes from a supercapacitor bank. At the moment, that's charged on the ground. But witches, that's wide attainment charging energy system, can take photons from any local stars or whatever and convert them into stored energy. The bigger the field, the faster we charge. Once that's finished and installed, in theory, Pandora could go from dry to fully charged in less than a minute just by sunbathing. She grinned. And of course, crazy prepared beauty that she is, if I did get stranded, the ship power plant is good for 50 lights. Not fast, but better than dying alone in deep space. Goru stood back and used his claws to comb some stray fur back behind one ear. I take it back. She's not merely beautiful. She's the most gorgeous thing I ever laid eyes on. Ah, oh, the ladies must be all over a charmer like you. I've sired my fair share of cubs, the Gowan agreed, sounding pleased with himself so Riley assumed that her compliment had been a success. He pulled a device that looked much like a smartphone from the pocket of his own flight suit and glanced at it, then said something which the station didn't translate. I should go. My clan father wants to have a word with me. It's been a pleasure, Goru, Riley said, still scarcely believing that she was already considering an alien raccoon to be a likable acquaintance and potential friend. She paid close attention to the markings of his fur around the eyes and muzzle and memorized them. It would be very embarrassing to have got on so well with him only to confuse him for some other Gowan. They shook hands again, and Goru ducked his head in what she took for a respectful gesture before jogging away. As Riley watched him go, she carefully tucked away the scrap of paper he had palmed her when they shook hands and busied herself with completing her post-flight checks. Did you succeed? Yes, father. In Goru's case, the title of respect bore a slightly more intimate meaning. The face looking back at him from the screen of his communicator bore markings and coloration that were almost a mirror of his own and there could be little doubt that Clan Father Amran was his sire. But that relationship was a distant second place to the bond of clan. Being the Clan Father's cub brought no special privileges, nor should it. The entire clan structure existed specifically to avoid that kind of nepotism, but they had a good relationship nonetheless. Excellent. The ambassador will be arriving shortly. We'll let this mockery of diplomacy play out. The important part has been accomplished. You've done well. Did you find it hard to get into the pilot's good graces? I didn't even have to act. Some of the innovations and philosophy that went into that little ship truly are stunning. And she's hopelessly in love with it. I confess, so am I. We adopted some of the ideas she told me about into our own craft. Now is neither the time nor the place, brother, the clan father reminded him. Goru ducked his head and flattened his ears, chagrined. Yes, father. Good lad. Take the first frost back to Gao. I've convinced a mother to join us. A mother? Yim ye. 
And yes, he said, holding up a paw and displaying tolerant good humor as Goru's expression lit up. She will have Sister Neral with her brother. You'll have plenty of opportunity to make a good impression before they head back. This was by way of being a reward for special success, and Goru could barely contain his gratitude. But the Fire Fangs prized emotional control and maturity, so he settled for a composed, Thank you, Father. Good luck with the ambassadors. More fool the others for making us need luck, Father Amrim practically spat the word. They can't possibly believe that concealing the existence of the Great Hunt and the Jettison Order will do anything but harm in the long run, can they? Goru asked. I truly have no idea. Gao voted in favor of full disclosure. We were overruled, and will face sanctions if I break that ruling during the session. Amran ruffled the fur at his shoulder irritably. Idiots. He recovered himself, giving his jaw a determined set. Goru, making a good impression with the humans is vital. It's only a matter of time before they discover how poorly their people have been treated by the Dominion, especially in response to the Great Hunt and Gao must get on their good side. Your rapport with their pilot and the influence of the clan of females might well tip the balance. I suppose we're just fortunate that we have the time to move behind the scenes before your note can be raised at the next meeting. Okay, she said. Those were some damn good pancakes. Told you. I should go. Yeah, you should. Yeah. She stood up and looked around the room. Um, do you know where my panties wound up? Somehow, I had expected something rather different. A warrior like his escort, not, well... The Vizkatic ambassador signaled the image of Dr. Hussein limping along the corridor, leaning heavily on his stick, even while engaging his aides and staff with avuncular small talk. Not a frail elder? asked the Ruaher ambassador. You have it exactly. A reminder of their physical abilities would make sense. And instead they're sending us this specimen? Clan Father Amrin chimed in at that point, and a few of the ambassadors flinched. The Gowan had been inside a privacy field for several minutes. They had all but forgotten he existed. In which case they have shrewdly outplayed you, he commented. A fair reminder to respect their intelligence, as well as their muscles, not so. The ambassador for the Cortai Directorate signaled agreement. Humans are not a savage species, gentle beings. They are from a savage world. There is a critical difference, and failing to remember it can only be dangerous. Forgive me, Ambassador, commented the Ambassador for the Kormbora, but they eat flesh. That in itself is a mark of savagery. The diplomats shot glances at one another. The Kormbora had suffered terribly from their close proximity to Hunter Space, and had suffered raids by those enigmatic evil things since before they had invented movable type. It had badly, but understandably, prejudiced them. So do my own species, Ambassador, Emran reminded him, voice calm and affable. Are we savages to you? The Kormboro wisely chose to maintain a diplomatic silence, but fidgeted sulkily in his seat, and the gathered dignitaries refrained from further conversation until the door opened and the station security director introduced the human. Dr. Anis Hussein, Ambassadors. The ambassadors rose from their seats in a mark of respect as the human limped in and looked around with a faint smile hands trembling slightly as he rested them on his cane. Well, thank you for the warm reception, he said. We have much to discuss, the Cortai ambassador said, as founding members of, and indisputably the most influential members of, the Dominion. It was tradition for the Directorate's ambassador to speak first on such occasions. But welcome, Doctor. This day has been sooner in coming than in the history of any other species yet known to us, and is all the more wonderful for it. Earth has already made big waves among the interstellar community and we are keen to see what more your people are capable of. There was a general murmuring of agreement, and the security director respectfully escorted the human to his own desk, diplomatically arranged as part of a circle, rather than in the interrogative middle of the room. To business, then, the doctor said. If I may say a few words? Of course. Excellent. He stood up, again resting himself gently against the table and selecting one of his notes, with that same trembling hand. He fastidiously opened a pair of reading glasses and set them on his nose, lifted the note up to peer at it, and then nodded, satisfied. <clears throat> Ultimatum from hunters. Demand all humans be turned over, else, quote, swarm of swarms, end quote, will raid known human locations. All ships, stations, carrying human passengers, advised. Jettison immediately. In the ringing silence, 
He set the paper down and gently tweaked it until its edges and corners were flush with its fellows. He took off his reading glasses, meticulously folded them, and set them carefully on top of his notes. Before looking up and skewering them all with a hard glare that bore no relationship whatsoever to the kindly sparkle his eyes had held only moments before. I think, ambassadors, he said, that we are owed an explanation. 